Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, my talk. Uh, as you said, unfortunately, my colleagues couldn't make it. Uh, some of them are child, children, wives, uh, you know the problem. So I am Rafael, uh, but you really need to keep in mind that uh, that's really a group project and uh, that was uh, started by Sarah, who is uh, the mastermind between, be, uh, behind the uh, abstract interpretation. So you will see that later. Uh, just a word before uh, my talk, so the tool is available, it's open source, uh, I will give, it, uh, give you the link at the end. So, uh, we'll in, I will introduce Bincat to show you what it's about, uh, then go a quick demo to show you how to use it and what we can do with it. Of course, we'll go under the hood to see what, uh, how it works, what we can do, and uh, we'll conclude with some uh, future work that we are going to do. So, a word of introduction, Bincat is a binary analyzer, so the goal is to analyze binary code, so programs from, for different architectures. Um, the main point is that it's a static analyzer, so at no point you are going to run actual code from the binary on the CPU. Everything will, will be done by the analyzer, and you will not be attacked by the code directly. For now, we support x86 32 bits. Well, we'll go back later into why we don't support other architectures yet. And uh, so the goal is to analyze x86 code, and we support uh, the idea is to com compute properties over the code we analyze. And uh, we can uh, analyze several things at the same time. So the first one that is very important is values. So we compute values for register and memories. We're able to track the register values and memory over the execution, so static execution of the program. We can also run taint analysis at the same time, bit level taint analysis, so we can show, uh, try to see how data is used and, s and follow the data flow for a particular register or memory. We'll see that with an example. Also, since we can do value analysis, we can track the value in memory in registers. And so while we reconstruct the control flow graph for disassembly, we are able to use the value analysis to reconstruct the indirect jumps that you can have. So for example, if you have an indirect call, differencing memory, or using a register value, then the analyzer should be able to compute the value and, and, and follow the indirect call. And we can also recover some types, we'll see that later. The analysis can be run in two modes, so we can run in forward mode, that is uh, mandatory, because you need to discover the control flow graph, so we'll run from the entry point and run the analysis forward. But then you, can, you may want to see, for example, uh, at the end of the analysis, some variable that you're interested in. You could add some taint and then run a backward analysis to find where the taint could come from. That will give you uh, a backward data flow analysis. One thing that we really wanted to make useful is uh, we know that reversals are lazy. I am a reverser, I am lazy. So I want to do everything in IDA. I don't use the Radari. Nobody uses the Radari, actually. So. <laughs> It's only in IDA, sorry. We'll see that if you want, you can write a radar plugin to integrate with Bincat, but well. So we want to make it easier, so we have an IDA integration with a guy, and you'll see that the pictures is pretty easy to use. And um, an interesting point is that uh, we have uh, Sarah, who is a very, uh, from an academic background, and she's uh, very good. So she wanted to make something that is really sound. So we, don't, we didn't like run around and do things randomly. Uh, we have a strong theory to back everything that we do, and I will go back on that later. And finally, uh, we wanted to make Bincat extensible, so it, to make it easy to add new things. The first one is that, of course, we don't analyze x86 directly. Nobody does that. So what we did is add a new intermediate language, uh, of course, a new one, uh, <laughs> to support x86, and the analysis re, uh, runs on the, on the intermediate language and not directly on the x86 code. So if you want to add a new decoder, you only have to write the decoder to uh, get your in intermediate language and then you run the analysis. And you can also extend the properties. So the properties can help each other and all the, the computations that are, are done in parallel. So as I said, for example, values are for the CFG, but you could add anything to you want. So that's nice, but oh, a demo is always better to understand what we're talking about. So we made a small example, uh, a toy example that covers some features of Binket that we wanted to show. So it's a simple Kijemi. I guess a lot of you have done Kijemis before. Uh, this one run on, runs on Linux. You just have to find the right license com, uh, com that for the company department and name, so usual thing. 
if you give it a wrong serial, it will show you wrong serial. Since we, are, we have a toy example, we also display the valid license so we can copy paste it and show another code path. So if you copy paste the right license, you run the tool again, you will get thank you for registering. So how does the license verification work? Here is the data, fl data flow that we will try to see with Binkat. So it takes the four arguments, including RV, then it computes uh, for each of the arguments a custom CRC32. Two of them are not used. Uh, we won't have the time to show why we added that, but that's uh, one of the points of Binkat. The two of company and names are multiplied together, uh, formatted using sprintf as the next string, then combined with another sprintf as a big string with all the arguments. This is input, is passed to a SHA1 hash function, I know it's outdated and not secure, but no, that's a toy example. So SHA1 formatted as X, and that's a valid license. So keep in mind that uh, the company and name are multiplied together, and we have a sprintf. So I'm going to show you a video demo, because it's easier for you to, to see. If it works, it's better. Okay. Uh, so we have IDA here, pretty familiar with it, but if you look closely on the left, you have two, three panels that we added that are for Binkat. So they will be there to show you all the information that Binkat has, com has computed over the binary. Here we want to analyze the, from the main function uh, of the toy example that I've shown before. So we put the cursor at the first instruction of the main function, then we run the tool with a shortcut. A configuration dialog pops up. It, all, it presents you with options that you, you can configure the analysis. Here, we will start with a completely new configuration. So when you click New Configuration, the IDA plugin actually generates a, full, a new configuration for Binkat from the information available in IDA. And here, you can see everything that is passed to the analyzer afterwards. So first, here we have a Linux binary. And since Binkat is able to support segmentation, we need to provide the GDT for, so that the analyzer knows to look for, where to look for, for data and code. So that's the default Linux GDT. But that's not the most important part. The most important part is this one. So here is the default initial state. Because when you run an analysis, you start at a point, but you have no idea what the register values are, what is on the stack, and, the, and whatever, because you cannot run the code. So here you need to supply the analyzer with an initial state so that you can run the analysis. Of course, you will supply the entry point because you need to start somewhere, but you also specify the registers. Here we use for most of the registers a special value that is unknown. So we, can, we say, okay, we don't know what's the register value, but you, this register will be able to take any value. So that's why we have uh, question marks here. We'll see that in the GUI later that you can see that clearly. And then, the only register that we actually define is ESP, because if you don't define a stack, nothing will work, because you push and pop, so it won't work. Here in, in our example, of course, uh, we want to run besides the usage that will show uh, enter your, your serial or whatever. So here we paste the configuration that is exactly as if we were running the binaries with five arguments. So we'll see in, in, in the memory later that we just pass some strings are, as arguments. And finally, at the end of the configuration, you have the imports. So IDA recognizes the imports, and they are passed to the analyzer because the analyzer needs to know when it's calling an external, to, uh, external library. Because the analyzer is static, so if you don't have the library or if you don't know that it's an external, external library, it will not be able to continue. So we'd save the configuration. And we we run the analysis. So it asks for a name. You have some uh, tools to, uh, to handle configuration. Then the analysis runs for a few seconds. And you will see that once the analysis is done, on the right you have the disassembly window, and all the instructions that have been analyzed by Binkat will be uh, colored in gray. So on the right, everything has been gray. And you can see maybe on the left that everything is uh, question marks except ESP. So that's the, where at the enter point. So that's the initial configuration that we define using the text window that you saw. So you see that everything is unknown. That it means everything could be, could be there, except ESP. But we can check at the end that uh, we have the actual RC, ArcV that we specified on the stack. So here you have RC being five and the pointer. And then you can look for in, the, in memory for the other pointers. And then you can go and check the actual strings that are best as arguments. 
So if you remember in the control in the data flow of the Kijenmi, we have a uh, sprintf that is used to format some strings. So we are going to see what did beancat recover from the sprintf call. So here we format the string in a buffer, uh, just saying company equal uh, something, the company that you specify. So remember that ac no actual instruction is executing on the CPU. So you need to, the, the analyzer needs to recognize that it's a, a sprintf and do something. So what is done here is that in Binka we have re-implemented a part of the sprintf call and it's actually doing it in t internally and not calling the libc function sprintf. So if you go on the stack and, and look at the buffer, destination buffer, you will see that the sprint of your results is actually correct. We formatted the string. But what is more interesting is that if we go and look for the arguments on the stack, we'll see that Pinkad was able to recover some type information. So here are the sprint of args. And if you uh, put the mouse over the, the address of the pointer, you get that it's actually a pointer to a character string. So that's the destination buffer. Here we have the second argument, which is uh, the format string, which is also a character a string. And the last one is the variable arguments that are passed to the to, to sprintf. So if we are able to re recover the types, of course we are able to recover the type of the return value, which is the number of characters as a signed 32 bits integer. integer. And um, so if we go back to the main functions, at the end we have in something interesting we have a, an indirect call. So here, uh, the code is, called, is calling a pointer that is stored on the stack. So Ida is completely lost because it cannot do value tracking and value analysis. So it doesn't know what value could be there. But Bincat actually saved the value in memory and could recover the value of the, of the, of the pointer. So if you go to the list of nodes, here we can choose the next node, which is actually the, the call, called function. So if we go there, we see that it's the bad guy printf that says bad serial. And here we also have a printf and that uh, displays the wrong serial. And uh, it's as the, print, the as printf that we had before, it's implemented in Bincat and it outputs the, the string on the emulated standard out. So in this demo, we saw that Bincat is able to statically run a binary and uh, do analysis on it. It's also able to recover some types. So you could consider it as a static debugger, for example. But it's able to do more than that. So if we go to the second demonstration, we have the same binary, but to change a bit, uh, we are going to use a valid serial because we are going to take another code pass. That's just for fun. Here, we want to see what happens when the program uh, checks for the serial. We want to see what is done on the company string that we provide. So what we do is we go to the configuration window, of, well, so to the X view, and then we select the company that we specified on the command line, and we say, taint this and rerun the analysis. So we say the taint to the XFF, taint everything, and then the analyzer runs. So from the outside, nothing changed, but if you look closely, you will see in the, in the data view that tainted data is actually displayed in green. So that's normal because we tainted company. And then we'll see that on the, on the right, what was previously completely gray includes also some green, yeah, some, so, so, but green lines, which mean that every line here in green manipulates tainted data. If it's a sub-function sub, sub call, and if it's green, it means that some instruction in the function manipulate tainted data. So if we go and look closely at the CRC32 computation, we'll, we'll go inside the function. And before uh, being able to compute the CRC, of course, we need to compute the length of the string. So you have a reps case B uh, usual uh, inline str line function, which is in green because, of course, we compute the length of the tainted function, tainted string. So the length is tainted too, and everything is, paint, is passed as an argument to custom CRC sorry to function. We're not going to the details, but the function returns the CRC in AAX. So if we look at AAX, everything is green. So you compute the CRC of a tainted string, the CRC is tainted, kind of logical. And if you look at EDX, you can look at the least significant label. It's painted in yellow. It means that 
Almost all EDX is not tainted, except in the last nibble, you have some bits that are tainted. So Bincat is able to track the taint at the bit level. And here we could go into the, the precise output and see which bit is actually tainted. So it was a flag, so that's the last one. And uh, at the end of the function, so we are going to use the CRC, and I'm just going to show how taint propagation works for arithmetic operations. So the first line actually reads the CRC that I've just shown from the company, and it multiplies it by the CRC of the name. So the first one is tainted, and the CRC of the name is untainted. So what, what happens when you multiply something tainted with something untainted? So here, you can recognize the CRC from company, 89BB. And when you multiply it with something untainted, you get BA20, so that's just the value. But of course, it's still tainted because when you multiply tainted data with untainted data, you get tainted data. So we, we are here have a taint analysis and we could multiply tainted data. And we are going to check how the format string uh, is, the formatting is done just before calling SHA1 function. So Right after the sprintf of all the things we had, have seen in the data flow, you get this buffer that is going to be hashed. And so if you look closely, you can maybe see it, but company uh, on the second line is in green. And the last line with the BA20, which is the CRC that we multiplied, is also in green. So why can we propagate the taint while formatting a string? That's because since we have a re-implementation of sprintf, uh, Binkat is able to propagate the taint even though we are calling an external function because otherwise we would be we would have to go through the real functions. So this string is passed passed as a to to compute its SHA1, and we are going to check if the actual SHA1 is tainted. Thankfully, everything is green. Uh, SHA1 is a hash function. You have bit diffusion, so if you change one bit, everything changes. So if we have a partial taint, probably everything is going to be tainted, which is the case here. And thankfully, the SHA-1 result is correct. It was complete, it's technically re remembered that nothing executes on the CPU. Then right after, uh, the, the KeyGenMe formats the SHA-1 string, no, sorry, the SHA-1 result as a hex string, so you have a small loop that will format everything. And here, you have a single address which was looped into by Bincat, so we can select all the different nodes that were created, so all the different iterations. And we are going to see here all the list. And if you will look into the X view and the memory view, we can iterate and see that the string is formed bit by uh, byte by byte, still keeping the taint. And so the final uh, string is tainted because the SHA-1 was tainted. So if we go back to the final comparison, you can see on the listing on the right that uh, here you have the string comparison. Everything is in green because we are comparing the string, the valid license, which is tainted to the one input by the user. And we have the final indirect call, this time to good guy, which says thank you for registering. So the indirect call is the same as before. The value is stored on the stack. IDA is lost, but Binkas is able to recover the value. So if you follow the call, you're, you're land here and you have the display, thank you for registering. So now we have seen that uh, Bincat is also able to do data tainting. Uh, it does all the other things, but we didn't have time to do that in the video. So how does it work under the hood? Uh, how, how can you use Bincat? So as you have seen, we use IDA, and uh, all the IDA par part is done in Python, and it talks to the Bincat binary, which is written in OCaml. So don't scream yet. The, that's a very good language to write some such complex tools. So how does the communication between the IDA plugin and the Bcat binary work? So we create a configuration file that you have seen at the beginning, and we pass it to the remap binary uh, to, to run the analysis. Uh, at the end of the analysis, Bcat returns the results and the logs. So that's for the local mode where you run the binary, oh, sorry, you run Bcat binary and IDA on the same machine. But sometimes you may want to run it uh, somewhere else. For example, if you need a more powerful machine to run the analysis, or if you're running Windows, because that's easier for, <laughs> for us to use Linux or Linux. So we include a web server that allows for remote Bincat usage. So you can install the plugin on the machine and have the, the Bincat running on server. And we provide a Docker image for easier deploy deployment. 
So how, how does it work internally? So as I said before, uh, to disassemble, we need to reconstruct the control flow graph. And uh, I'm going to go into the details of how that, that works in BitCAD. So here you have a partial control flow with already four states. And we're going to see what happens at state four and uh, while the disassembly and reconstruction is done. So st what, what is included is in, in a state. Everything, everything known by the analyzer at that point. So you have, of course, the EIP, which means where is the instruction situated. The value of AAX, for example, we, of course, reduce the state for the, for the slide. And you can see here that EAX is 7 FFFF, and that one of the nibbles of EAX is tainted, so it's in green. We also have the flags and everything. So everything is passed to the decoder, so the state is passed to the decoder. So we have a EIP, we have the context, the segments, everything needed to read the code. Then the decoder will read the memory, the code memory to identify the instruction. So here we have a ink EAX as an example, and it will produce the intermediate language that, is con that corresponds to the instruction ink AAX. So if we look into detail, you see that the intermediate, lang the intermediate language actually increases EAX, as you could expect, and computes all the flags that are needed for after computing X ink AAX. So those statements, are passed to the state generator along with the state, and the statements are going to be applied to the previous state, computing a new state. So state five is the result of the statements over the previous state. Here, if we look closely, EIP was incremented by one as we had a one byte instruction. Then AAX has changed to 80,000, so it was actually incremented. But if you look, you can see that now we have four nibbles that are tainted, because since we had 7FFFF, we had a carry, and so the taint was propagate, propagated through the carry. So we have four nibbles tainted before we only had one. The flag was updated. And at the end, we check if the state was previously seen, and if it's, it has been previously seen, we stop. And if it's new, then uh, we continue. Then you, when you think a bit, you know, like, okay, we, we do the analysis, we can use says. What happens if you have an infinite loop where you have a long loop? Well, it should terminate at some point, otherwise you could wait forever for the program to stop. So thankfully, we have a strong theory and which helps us to say this will terminate. So we use static analysis by abstract interpretation, which I'm going to try and explain in one slide. Not easy. So instead of uh, operating on actual values, so for Binket, we use values, 10 types, and other things. So instead of operating on real values, uh, all operations are done on abstract objects, which actually represent sets of values or chains of types. So for example, the abstract zero represents the set of values containing only zero. But if you take the uh, question mark that we have seen before, well, a question mark says this can be any of the integers of this size. For the same for the types, we could have type struct, the abstract type struct, which is an overall approximation which says this is a representation of all the C structs. And we do all the computations on those abstract objects, and the computations that we do must always be an over approximations of the actual ones. So we are going to see an example of how we can approximate loops, which will show you why the analysis will actually terminate. So that's called loop widening. On the right, you have here the loop that you are going, we are going to analyze. So it's pretty trivial. While ESI is less than 8,000, increment ESI by four. And the red point is where we are going to run the states on the left. So on the first state, we have ESI that is 1,000, which um, to last, uh, least significant byte is tainted, as it's in green. And we have its type, uh, which is a pointer to uh, integers. So the idea here is pretty simple. To avoid infinite loops, we are going to look at uh, the execution of the loop and see what changes and what is stable. So here you have a S2 that is uh, crossed, and that's the computation if you were doing it for real. But there, we're going to check what has changed and what is stable. So between the two iterations, what has changed is the value of ESI. It changed from 1,000 to 1,004. So we replace it by an over approximated value, which is unknown. So we don't know the value of ESI now. But if you look closely, the type hasn't changed and the taint hasn't changed. So we're in a stable. We run another iteration of the loop. 
So we add four to the unknown value. So when you add four to unknown, you get unknown, so that's stable. When you add four to the taint, then you get unknown because uh, since we don't know if you have carry or anything, you could propagate the, we need to propagate the taint to the whole uh, register. So we don't know the taint anymore, but the type is stable. And if we do the loop another time, we will see that nothing changes, so we are stable. And thanks, thanks to two theorems, uh, we, we have two properties that are really interesting. So the SI prime sequence is ultimately stationary, stable, so we'll have the same value over, over time. And this value that we will get over iterating this widening is very interesting because it's actually uh, an over approximation of the real execution trace. So if you say ESI is unknown and the taint is unknown, if you take any actual uh, state from the execution, it will be in the set of the, the abstract state. So that's pretty neat. It means that you will not have to wait forever, but of course you lose precision because at the end of the loop you're like, I don't know the value of ESI. Thankfully we have some techniques that allow for better precision, but don't, we don't have time to present them right now. So what's really nice is that we have a theory that says everything is going to be correct, even if though it's maybe over approximated. In theory, the implementation should be correct, but if anyone has tried to do an x86 decoder in their life, they will know that it's really, really painful and that you will get a lot of bugs. So the decoder is complex, the abstracting operations are complex, so what we try to do is do a lot of unit tests to validate that your actual disassembly and value computations are correct. So we run Binkat versus a real CPU, you compare the results and see if we, if we get the same results as a CPU does. So we have our over 67,000 tests. And we also run uh, Binkat over the QMU test binary that is used by QMU to verify that the way they implement the instructions is correct versus the CPU. So we use that, and that's pretty cool. Uh, so you may wonder how fast the analyzer is. So on the toy example that I showed before, the, the Kijinmi, it takes uh, six seconds to run uh, 80 megabytes of RAM. That's about 1,000 instructions per second. And on the QMU test binary, which is way more complex, we got more than 200,000 instructions, a little bit more than two gigabytes of RAM in 23 minutes. So, you have seen what Binkat is about, uh, is about what we can do. Uh, what are we working on? So that's what we had, and what we have right now, and that's what we are working on. So, we want to have a better type reconstruction we would like to be able to, for example, look at the accesses on the stack and recover the different fields of a structure that could be uh, hinted by our heuristics. One very important feature that we are going to add is for now, we only have one taint source. So for example, in the toy example that we had, if you took the company and the name and tainted them at the same time, at the, in the end you will get a result and it would be like, hmm, uh, I know this is tainted, but I don't know if it comes from the company or if it comes from the name. So we are going to add several taint sources so we can uh, run one analysis and have the follow different data flows at the same time. Uh, we are going to refine the computation for backward uh, analysis. We are, we also, we'll also model more standard library function like sprintf or other ones. And we want to also Im uh, improve the user experience uh, by adding new functions in the IDA plugin. So for example, the configuration that I copy pasted for ArcCRGV, we want to add a way for the user to directly define the memory into IDA by clicking, for example, on the arguments and say, hey, I want to define this argument in Binkat. So that's the improvements that we want to make. We also have future features that we want to work on. So we, we, could add, uh, we will probably add some finer approximation on value computations. So for now, we are use bit vector to represent the values of uh, registers and memory, and we could use, for example, intervals to be more precise in, the, in some values. Uh, one goal is to also add uh, C++ object reconstruction, which would be awesome. And we also want to add some things on the decoder side, and we want to add uh, ARM and x86-64 uh, decoders. So you have the full paper that is linked here. Uh, the link is quite long, so you can find it in the readme if you want to read it. And you can get it on GitHub right now or running from Docker. Uh, you have a full tutorial in the doc slash tutorial.md uh, 
that corresponds to the example that I've shown. You also have the videos that I've shown, so you're ready to use it. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi, nice presentation, nice project. Uh, I would like to know uh, how uh, can you scale, uh, I mean, interpretation of real applications? So the, the idea of the project is not to, uh, to be able to analyze uh, wall applications. The idea is to really have something that is usable directly by the reverser integrated into IDA. So for example, if you reach a function that is too complex to analyze, but uh, you, you want to see, for example, and take the input and see what it, where it goes, you can do it from, uh, with Binkat. We, um, one of the points is that most of projects of interpret, uh, abstract interpretation try to solve the world, uh, and it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So the idea is really to interact with the user. So we, for now, we don't have much interaction, but we sometimes, uh, the goal is to, when the analyzer doesn't know what to do because it's, it's lost, because it has too many possibilities, it's to ask the user, so do you want to remove this, uh, this option, for example? Because you know that's an error pass that is not interesting. And so the, the idea is to help the analyzer, uh, sorry, help the reverser and not have the analyzer do everything. Uh, second question, uh, can it handle dynamically load libraries? Uh, so, if, so if you map the library in the address space that is known by Binkat, you can, of course, uh, run the analysis on the actual code, but you will get probably uh, an explosion of the number of instructions to analyze. So. The, the idea is more to create stubs for external libraries if you can model, model, model them. Or if they don't have any side effect, you can just uh, ignore them. By default, it will just skip over imports. Thank you. Yes, uh, which domains are used to model memory and which algorithms and or domains are used for type reconstruction? Uh, so, unfortunately, Sarah is not there. She's the one who actually did all the very complex abstract interpretation parts. So the domains for values are uh, vectors of bits, which use uh, 0, 1, or top as a value. Uh, and the type reconstruction, I'm sorry, I cannot help, but it's, de uh, it's detailed partially in the paper. Or you can send an email to, to have more details. Hi, uh, do you handle taint propagation to flags? So if you have a branch that's controlled by a, on a compare of a control value? Very, very good question. Uh, so the, the tainting is actually only data flow in theory. So what we did is for our conditional moves in Intel, we, if the flag is tainted, we, we taint the destination. But for complex things like big ifs, then else branches, if you taint, because the flag is tainted, you, reach, you, you will probably reach uh, like over tainting very quick, quickly. So we haven't implemented that yet, but what we want to do is actually tell, uh, allow the analyst to tell Bincat if he wants to taint all the instructions that are in a branch. So that will help cover the mix between data and control flow, which is not a problem that is possible to solve in general. Okay, thanks. Another question over here. Just going to do one more and then uh, take a break. So you uh, mentioned that you made an x86 decoder and that you want to support uh, x86-64. Um, why didn't you use Z? Um, the, the answer is simple. Uh, the project was partially uh, financed initially for a part of French DOD, and uh, their requirement was x86. So we started with x86. That's all. And we didn't have time to, to add 64 bits yet. Thank you very much. <laughs>